please join me in welcoming Dr. Rick Hansen. Coming on, good. Well, thank you. That was very kind of you to introduce me in that way. I've never been here to Unity and Marin. In fact, I've never actually been this far down. Um, what is it, Front Gate Road or Main Gate Road? Yeah, and I've lived in Marin for 30 years, so my oversight, obviously. And I feel very honored to be able to do this with you and glad at the opportunity in an intimate setting, really, to talk about how you can use your mind alone to change your brain, to change your mind for the better. And that's going to be my fundamental focus today. So my intent is to hold forth on a series of topics. These are my topics tonight. And I'll pause for questions and comments from time to time. Also, if you're willing, I propose to do a couple of uh, private, internal, guided practices. And you're always you know, able to do whatever you want with those practices. And then I'll try to preserve a little extra time at the end for a general free-for-all of questions and discussion. And then, then we'll finish up with some kind of a short practice uh, and end very close to 9.15. Sound okay? Sound like a roll? All right, great. Okay, good. So uh, as to a fault, I tend to talk with a fire hose kind of effect. So uh, one of the details here is that I will send you a PDF of this slide set so you can have it for yourself. Also on my own website, which you can reach through rickhanson.son.net, or if it's easier to remember, through buddhisbrain.com. Um, there are talks and slide sets from uh, this presentation or others like it, as well as many other workshops uh, I've done that you can go access for free. I have a ton of material there. That's, for me, the point, is to offer it freely. It's kind of a toolbox for people. So uh, you don't need to worry too much about this material. There will be no test at the end, no midterm, no worries about that. Um, and I will slow down from time to time, as I said, for discussion. Okay, so let's dive in. Boom. So perspectives. Um, I hope to talk tonight at the center of these three circles, uh, neuroscience, psychology, and contemplative wisdom, especially Buddhism, which is the contemplative tradition I know best, and which has probably had the most crossover with Western science, probably because Buddhism shares two core values with Western science. First, empiricism, taking nothing on faith alone, and then second, pragmatism, a focus on causes and results. Well, I think of the great Dharma question that Dr. Phil offers routinely. So, how's that working for you? All right, for better or worse. So we're gonna talk about some of the causes in the brain that you can affect that um, will make things go for better rather than for worse. It's also true, as Oppenheimer talked about here, and you can read the slide, that when you bring t multiple traditions together, uh, such as the Western traditions of neuroscience and psychology, and let's say the Eastern traditions of contemplative practice, those sidebar, of course, Western religions such as Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, uh, as well as others, also certainly have a very strong contemplative wing. So when you bring, bring these two different traditions or perspectives together, sparks fly, you get cross-validity checks because when both the quantum physicists and the deep yogis seem to be pointing at the same moon, it gives you some confidence, greater confidence that there really is a moon there. Also, you discover new methods. That's one of the things that I'll be exploring with you tonight to some extent. In other words, by studying the brains of contemplative practitioners, in, se in a sense, studying the brains of the Olympic athletes of mental training, as they're sometimes called, we can start getting a better understanding of what's going on in the brain when people are in the states of mind that we care about, of inner peace, spiritual insight, resilience, strength of heart, strength of mind, uh, concentration, uh, deep insight into the nature of everything. As we understand better what's going on inside the black box of the brain, as these people have trained their brain over time to be able to enter those states, then we ourselves can become more able to work backwards in a kind of reverse engineering and use the mind alone to stimulate those states in the brain that underlie those wonderful states of mind. So, on the other hand, it's important to have a certain humility here. 
Uh, first, we need to be open to new information. I love this quote. We could update it in terms of uh, sexual language. You know, what, I changed my mind, ma'am. What do you do? Anyway, uh, I like that fundamental attitude of an openness to new information. Brain science, which I'll be talking some about tonight, is a baby science. It's estimated that the amount of knowledge in brain science has doubled in just the last 20 years. In other words, uh, scientists, people in general, know twice as much today about the three pounds of tofu inside the coconut than they did in 1990. Uh, so it's in that spirit that we need to be appreciating that what we're talking about is just the beginnings of what's becoming understood about what's going on you know, inside the brain. It's also the case that we fundamentally do not know how conscious experience manifests. It's said that there are three great scientific questions that remain. The first one is, why is there something rather than nothing? In other words, what caused the Big Bang? Nobody knows. Second great scientific question, what's the underlying grand unified theory that integrates quantum mechanics and general relativity? both of which are um, consistent and proven by research um, in their own right, and yet at their foundations contradict each other. What's the theory that pulls it all together, that is the complete explanatory theory of the physical universe? No one knows. And the third great question is, how in the world are we doing this right now? How are you sensing what you're sensing, thinking what you're thinking, suffering or having happiness, creating harm or creating benefit for other people, just discerning the color red. No one knows the answer to that question. As we'll see, it is increasingly well known how the mind and the brain are stitching together, right? The connecting of the dots between mental activity, thinking, feeling, hoping, dreaming, seeing, hearing, sensing, etc., and neurological processes of transmitter, neurotransmitter flows, large-scale networks of neurons organizing together, firing for a time, and then dispersing again, et cetera, et cetera. It's getting clearer and clearer how the dots are connected. But at this fundamental point of the where mind and brain meet together, it's an explanatory gap. I like I liken it myself. I think of the picture at the top of the Sistine Chapel of God's finger coming down toward Adam's, but there's a gap fundamentally between. We still don't know the answer to that question. So it's in that context, of course, that I will be talking about um, correlations, at least, co-arisings, at least, of mind and brain simultaneously. All right. So, to the meat of the matter, literally. This is your brain, all right? This is a real brain. It's not your brain, really, it's not. I remember the first time I saw a brain, it was literally in a bucket. Uh, I was in a continuing ed class for a psychologist and neuro on neurology, and the professor brought it in, and with a dramatic flourish, you know, lifted off the lid of this strange bucket, formaldehyde-filled the lecture hall, whips on some, le some rubber gloves. I think they were yellow. I remember that detail. You know, you remember these things. Reaches down, whoosh, pulls up a brain. It was one of those moments of, oh my God, that little nondescript, it looks like gushy cauliflower, basically. That little nondescript organ uh, is literally the most complex object known to science today. Um, it's built from 1.1 trillion cells in about three pounds of tissue. Uh, 100 billion of those, 1.1 trillion cells, roughly 10%, one in 10, is a neuron, like that one. That's a basic neuron, quick little neuron stuff. It's a little on-off switch, okay? This little neuron makes about 5,000 connections on the average with the other neurons in the brain. So if you think about that, if you've got 100 billion switches making 5,000 connections each, that gives you about 500 trillion synapses or connections inside your own brain. And uh, neurons are firing on the average about 5 to 50 times a second. So this neuron here, our average neuron, is receiving inputs uh, 5 to 50 times a second from 5,000 other neurons. And based on the moment-to-moment -moment summation of those signals, which are basically green lights and red lights, you know, gas pedals and brake pedals, into this little switch here, based on that moment-to-moment -moment summation, it fires or it doesn't. When it fires, this little signal ripples down the long wire called the axon that connects this neuron to other neurons downstream. It's wrapped in insulation called myelin. Myelin is this little fatty tissue. Uh, and some of the other 
trillion cells in the brain myelinate neurons. As, the, as we develop in childhood, the brain myelinates from kind of the bottom and back up and toward the front, and that increasing amount of insulation is associated with increased functioning because myelination uh, speeds up neural signals. The takeaway here is that as teenagers, uh, as their brains myelinate, they develop greater judgment. All right. And it's actually, unfortunately, the case that girls tend to myelinate faster than boys do, which can explain some of the differences you see in teenage boys and girls, having just raised a 20-year-old and a 23-year-old still, boy and girl. So, you know, myelination is a good thing, and a lot of neurodegenerative diseases attack myelination. All right, so we have the insulation, signal goes down, comes to the very end, bloop, in most neurons, uh, a signal sends out a little bubble of neurotransmitter molecules. It disperses into this tiny space between this neuron and the downstream neuron. And then that constitutes an incoming signal for the downstream neuron. To get a sense of the scale here, you could put about five cell bodies, the big fat part on the left-hand side of the screen of the neuron, five cell bodies side by side in the width of a human hair. You could put about 5,000 cell bodies, pardon me, 5,000 synapses side by side in the width of a single hair. In other words, this little junction between neurons is really tiny, so when these bubbles of neurotransmitter molecules diffuse into that space, they're very quickly taken up by the downstream receiving neuron, which then constitutes a signal for it. So if you get a sense of it, wow, we have 100 billion neurons, and they're uh, firing 5 to 50 times a second, and in most cases, uh, they signal each other by sending chemicals out. Sidebar, some neurons signal each other through electrical impulses alone, but in most cases, they do it through sending little molecules out, which then have to be taken up by little R2-D2 molecular units and other cells to go back into the neuron to be transmitted again. This organ, which is just about 2% of body weight, consumes about 20% of the oxygen in our blood and 25% of the glucose circulating in the blood as well. And it's hungry, it's busy, and it's roughly as metabolically active when we're sound asleep as when we're concentrating hard and doing a lot of mental activity. Um, so because this brain is ready to go 24-7, it consumes a lot of supplies. That's why I think it's important to pay attention to what we eat, you know, how we treat our brain, because it really consumes a lot of material. It needs a lot of building blocks every day. All right, so these neurons now are connected with each other in a vast network, which makes the brain the most complex object known to science. It's more complex than an exploding star. It's more complex than the American economy. I mean, it literally is the most complex object truly known to science. So, you know, the, the point here is in the bottom three images, it just gives you a sense of the connectivity of the brain. What they did in this particular study is they took a thousand regions of interest in the brain, cross-correlated them as a measure, in a sense, of the information superhighway of the brain. These are a little bit like a satellite shot of Earth at night. When you see the lights of cities and the lights of highways that connect cities to each other, that's something like this, roughly. In other words, whatever happens in the brain is a network phenomenon. It's a system up there. Okay? So now I've talked so far about the brain itself, kind of a quick and dirty, you know, cliff note takeaway um, of the brain. And now I want to talk through the most conceptually difficult slide I have after we get through this one. Really, it's downhill, wind at our back, clear sailing. I need to talk about the mind and the brain together and define some terms. So. People literally have been burned at the stake for different opinions about this, what's on the slide. When you're grappling with or thinking about the interaction of the mind and the brain, it's important, I think, to respect and take into account long-standing religious and philosophical engagement with this question. And when dealing with a potential, certainly a murky and difficult and uh, sometimes um, provocative and thorny question, like the relationship between the mind and the brain, because it brings immediately questions of spirit into it all, I think it's useful to use to define our terms clearly, to, to, to know what we mean by the words we use. So when I use the word mind here, <clears throat> I'm using it the way neuroscientists generally use it, which is to say, as essentially 
the flows of information through the whole nervous system. That may sound a little odd at first, but we have many examples around us of where a physical substrate of some kind represents non-physical information. For example, driving here, you may have come to a traffic light, right? red, yellow, green. The color, as it were, is based on wavelengths of light that are emitted. That's material in a sense of E equals MC squared. Right? It's one big system. So that's physical or material, if you will. Um, but the meaning of the red wavelength or the meaning of the yellow or green wavelength is just simply um, is not physical. Think of your computer hard drive. That's physical and it represents um, not physical information of words, uh, songs, pictures of your summer vacation, and so forth. Uh, this computer we're using right now is um, physical and it's representing the meaning of the words up there on the slide. In the same way, the nervous system moves information around, much like the heart moves blood around, except information is not physical. Most of that information is forever outside of awareness. It consists of signals, um, learnings, inclinations, uh, expectations that are below the waterline, forever outside of consciousness. We privilege the tiny tip of the iceberg that is um, the uh, mental activity represented by the nervous system that we're aware of. We privilege what we're conscious of, what we're aware of, because it's what we know. All right? But nonetheless, where the real action in the brain is, is in the underlying unconscious or semi-conscious habits of the heart, for better or worse. This means that, in the way I'm using the word, other than a hypothetical transcendental principle, uh, a cosmic consciousness, Judeo a Judeo-Christian God, uh, the 10,000 forms of Brahma in Hinduism, Yahweh, Allah, uh, or the ground, spirit, the divine, or by no name at all. Other than that element, essentially the mind is what the brain does. And with a bow to the transcendental, my own position is of the three great positions, you know, theist, agnostic, and atheist, I'm a theist, but with a bow to the transcendental, I'm going to stay within the frame of Western science. The way I think of it, therefore, is that, as we'll see, mind and brain co-arise. It's not that uh, the, the mind reduces to the brain, because it can't, nor is it that uh, the mind dominates the brain. I think of them as two aspects, nama and rupa in Hindu language, together co-arising. All we know is what's in the realm of mind. Okay? What you see right here in your in your vision is a tiny fraction of, of what reality actually is, without getting mystical about it. It's just that we only see in very narrow band of the electromagnetic spectrum. We only hear in a tiny range. A dog hears higher octaves. Uh, hawks see things we don't see. Um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a constructed world. We live in the constructed world. Right? And yet every event in the constructed world of conscious awareness maps one-to-one -to, -one to an underlying neural process. Right. So uh, in the Hindu language, nama is the world of consciousness. Rupa is the world of materiality. Uh, all we know is nama, as it were, and yet every nama has an invisible dance partner, you know, an invisible rupa, an invisible neurological event that co-arises simultaneously with any mental event in this way of thinking about it. You don't have to agree with this, but for me this is the frame in which I'm going to try to talk about now um, some practical things. Okay? So I'll keep going. Are we okay so far? I've kind of skated across the... I've really learned crossing thin ice. I've done a lot of rock climbing, and there's certain slabs that are fairly steep. You can climb them. But you have to keep moving because your feet start sliding down, you know, if you slow down. So I'm going to keep going here. Okay. Three facts now about the relationship between the mind and the brain. The first fact is that as the brain changes, the mind changes, for better or worse, right? Better, so-called, on the left side, caffeine, sugar, water, uh, or on the right side, an NFL player in the moment of getting a concussion. There's some examples of the ways that as the brain changes, the mind changes here. For example, on the better side, if you have more activation of your left prefrontal cortex, you typically have more positive mood. Why is that? 
Well, it's because the left prefrontal cortex is involved in putting the brakes on negative emotion. So if you have greater inhibition, if you will, or regulation of negative emotion, you're likely to have more positive mood, more happiness altogether. On the other side of the coin, in terms of the brain changing for the worse, if there are chronic experiences of stress, even relatively mild stress, but pervading and continual, and certainly with, this is true for severe in, and perhaps, as well as traumatic stress, that releases cortisol as well as other stress hormones. Cortisol goes into the brain and it gradually degrades a part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is involved in memory for context, putting things in perspective, as well as for visual spatial memory. The effect of it is up to a 25% reduction of the volume of the hippocampus as a result of chronic stress. And when you degrade a part of the brain that does something, the brain is less able to do that thing. It's kind of like if you weaken your biceps over time, you can't lift things with this motion as well. Right? That's an example of the brain changing for the worse and the mind changing for the worse as well. The second fact is that as the mind changes, the brain changes. Now we're looking at it from the other direction. We're looking at causality flowing the other way. For example, um, as people um, have different ideas or thoughts or feelings, there are changes of brainwave patterns, there are ebbs and flows of neurochemicals, and particular parts of the brain that perform particular functions activate to do that function. For example, here we have a picture of a college student who's head over heels in love, lying in an MRI, who's just been shown a picture of his or her sweetheart. All right? And this part of the brain is the caudate nucleus. It's a reward center in the brain that activates uh, when we feel rewarded. Kind of makes sense. You know, there you are, head over heels, you're in college, you're young, you know, the world is wide open, and zing, you see your sweetie pie. By the way, Josh, I don't know if this is super tightly focused. Maybe that's as good as we can do it. I don't know. But anyway, um, that part of the brain also activates with cocaine and winning the lottery. I'm not equating these. But um, it's a reward center in the brain altogether. A little more esoterically, now we have a picture of a Tibetan monk who's doing boundless compassion practice, sending compassion non-referentially to all beings. And he's doing that while inside an MRI, which is banging away at him, and he's got to really concentrate. So he has particularly activated that orangey blob up, and this is a slide sliced like this, going that way. The previous slide, by the way, was sliced this way. This one is sliced that way, okay? A part of the brain called the anterior, which means frontal, cingulate cortex, is um, activating here because it helps control attention. How many of you meditate at least one minute a month? One minute a month, good, low bar, Greg is great, okay. When you meditate, no more questions about that sort of thing. Anyway, wh when you meditate, because it's a preeminent uh, practice of attention, uh, you are using your anterior front, uh, cingulate cortex because you are deliberately controlling attention. This is involved in the uh, um, executive control of attention. Now, by the way, it looks like the rest of the brain has gone dark. Uh, that orangey thing is just painted in. Basically, it means that that part of the brain is about 2 to 3% more metabolically active. It's consuming, it's eating, as it were, uh, about 2 to 3% more oxygen. But that's enough to be noticeable and to pick up on a signal in an MRI. Hmm? As another example of the mind changing and thus the brain changing, we have a study done on Christian uh, nuns, Carmelite nuns, I believe in Montreal, who were asked to recall a profound spiritual experience. They activated, the slides up here are a little busy. Again, these are slices of their brain looking this way. Um, I just want to draw your attention to three key uh, regions that lit up, as it were, when they did that. In other words, when their mind was drawn to this experience of probably union with the divine, a kind of bride of Christ, very heartfelt kind of experience, um, three parts of their brains in particular activated. One was the ACC, anterior cingulate cortex, upper left uh, image. They were concentrating. 
They were deliberately controlling their attention in this strange MRI environment to bring up this experience. Second part of the brain that activated was the insula. Uh, in the second to the right slide in the top row, insula, that's a part of the brain that's on the inside of the temporal lobes that's involved in interoception, tuning into yourself, particularly your body sensations or gut feelings. Interestingly, the insula is also involved in empathy for other people, you know, seeing how they're doing. So interestingly, studies have actually shown that as you practice more tuning into your own body, you become more self-aware and you also become more empathic, in particular for the feelings of others. Quick little sidebar, there are just about two of everything in the brain, I think in Noah's Ark, you know, where they all came two by two. Um, so there are two insulas, there are two amygdalas, there are two hippocampuses, and so forth. The convention is just to talk about them in the singular, so that's how I'll talk about them. Okay, the third part of the brain that uh, lit up when they did this was, guess what, caudate. In the upper row, because that's all we're looking at here, the uh, third and fourth from the left slides, caudate, left caudate, and right caudate. This reward center of the brain also activated a lot when they were tuning into this profound spiritual experience. And now, it's not that the Tibetan monk was not feeling rewarded by compassion or in touch with his body, but it, there wasn't enough activation there to pick up a signal. On the other hand, these nuns, and I think no accident, you know, Christian and female, and the nature of the experience, profound spiritual experience, rather than something fairly subtle like compassion for all beings, no accident, they were in touch with their bodies and felt very rewarded by it, as well as needing to concentrate. Okay? We could get into the details of this, but the larger point I'm just making here is how, as the br mind changes, the brain changes as well. Now, so far I've spoken of only temporary, fleeting changes which is remarkable as it is, that the fleeting ebb and flow of ineffable thought maps to very material and gushy, you know, flows of molecules and electrical signals inside this physical organ. Additionally, the flows of thought leave lasting traces in the brain. The mind can change the brain, not just in temporary ways, but in lasting ways. And this has to do with what's called experience-dependent neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity being the capacity of the brain to be plastic, in other words, to be malleable, to be changeable over time. So, for example, um, busy regions, routinely busy regions, end up getting more blood flow. Also, um, there are changes in gene expression, epigenetics, that are based on flows of thought. For example, people who routinely practice relaxation have improved expression of genes, little strips of atoms, amazingly, in larger molecules, but just a molecule of DNA. These genes have improved expression. They're more able to do their work to control the stress response, thereby making a person more resilient. Isn't that kind of remarkable? They're just kind of lying there, or sitting, or thinking about white fluffy clouds, or you know, listening to Stephen Halpern music, or something like that, you know, can actually, ch can actually unpack twisted strands of molecular DNA so that the little strip of genes in question, little strips of atoms in question, the gene there, can do more work. Wow. Also, related to the saying of the Canadian psychologist Donald Hebb, neurons that fire together wire together. Okay? It sounds like a rap song, doesn't it? You know? um, anyway, and to show you an example of that, uh, I'll hit the Next slide here. This was a study that was done on long-term meditators in Buddhist mindfulness vipassana style meditation. And what it showed was that in a relationship to uh, comparing the meditators, they're the blue dot people to the red square control group, the meditators had literally thicker brains in three regions, two that are particularly important. The first is that, in that image is kind of a blobby image of someone looking this way, all right? Uh, they had greater, I'll do number two first, in reverse order. They had greater uh, cortical tissue. They had more synapses forming. They had more uh, switches, more density of neural capacity, more muscle, in a sense, neurologically, in the two up there, regions in the front of the brain, where you can control attention. No surprise, they were working the muscle of deliberate controlled mindfulness, attention, and they, they got better at it. it. The muscle got bigger. 
the number one region is the insula. Interestingly, they, because they were routinely tuning in themselves, routinely practicing interoception, a part of the brain that was involved in self-awareness, uh, awareness of the body, and interestingly, with a side benefit, bonus, empathy for other people, also grew measurably thicker. The third region is on the top of the head, somatocentric cortex. They were tuning into their body, and so they had more, you know, a bit more build out of that part of the brain. Isn't it interesting? that as they did practices that a lot of us in here do, they, um, had a thick, they developed thicker cortical tissues compared to the control group. Also, interestingly, if you look at the scatter plot down here, there's another important point. Normally, we lose about 10,000 brain cells a day. And that may seem like a lot, but when you start out with 1.1 trillion, we lose about 4% or so by our 80th birthday. It, uh, um, that's called cortical thinning due to aging. Normal cortical thinning, and it's associated with normal cognitive decline as we age. Not dementia, not Alzheimer's, but normal cognitive decline. And that's what you see in the red square people. In other words, as they got older, cortex in these key regions got thinner. You can see the word thickness on the y-axis of the little scatter plot there. But interestingly, the blue dot people who worked that muscle did not experience any cortical thinning due to aging. They used it so they did not lose it. And that has lots of implications for an aging population. So, takeaway point here, experience really matters. What we casually indulge in, in our minds, both is something we feel in the moment and affects how we act, but it also can leave lasting traces behind. There's a traditional saying in Buddhism, the mind takes the shape of what it rests upon, for better or worse, right? The modern update would be, the brain takes the shape that the mind rests upon, right? If we routinely rest the mind upon resentments, anger, grumbling, our case about other people, self-criticism, you know, guilty rumination, anxious rumination, if we rest the mind there, the brain will gradually take the shape of greater vulnerability to depression, uh, more anxiety, more fragility, more sensitivity. Not good. On the other hand, if we rest the mind routinely on the small, many small moments of everyday good news in life, in most people's lives, if we rest it on our own accomplishments, if we rest the mind on the kindness, the small kinds of kindness and cooperation that come our way all day long, if we do that, we then have a different brain, a brain that takes the shape of greater resilience, improved mood, more resources inside, more strength inside to be able to deal with the challenges in life and make this world a better place. That's really the takeaway for us. It leads us to the third fact, <coughs> which is that you can use your mind to change your brain, to change your mind for you, the better. And that's the power, really, of self-directed neuroplasticity. Okay. Any questions or comments so far? Yeah, right there. Yes. I don't know. Um, I just don't know. Uh, I just don't know. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, the, oh, the one on the top is fairly trivial. Not that the seventh chakra is trivial. I just mean that little part of the brain is involved in the map of the body. For example, if you touch your fingers right now, a little part uh, of the brain up here will activate just based on a body map. So I don't know if I would give that part of the brain the status I would want to give the seventh chakra you know, or the locus in some way, or maybe the, I think of it as maybe the receiver, you know, it's like a radio receiver, is, you know, but uh, the, mm, the part in the front, executive control of attention, um, you know, when I think about some of the, kept, you know, what we associate with the sixth chakra, uh, I don't, I don't know. I, I think that um, this goes to the point really of neuroscience being a baby science. Uh, we're discovering why these, some of these traditional practices uh, 
developed actually because we're now understanding why certain meditative practices really can affect the brain. For example, why, as I'll say later, positive emotion really helps steady the mind based on dopamine reward systems and stuff like that. I suspect as well, a hundred years from now, there will be a much deeper understanding of these esoteric systems in yoga and in other places and how they link to um, you know, material processes in the body. Yeah. Okay, I'll repeat the question. Sure. Um, you, you spoke a moment ago about a control group and how meditators develop certain areas of the brain and they were not developed in the control group. Have you ever done studies over a period of time to see the development within a particular individual of certain brain centers? Because it could be that because it, those senses are already developed, those individuals are drawn to meditate more easily right. and more naturally. Yeah, it's a very legitimate question. So, a couple parts. First, I myself am a clinician. I'm a methods guy working in the trenches, so I don't do research. I happily consume a lot of it, but I don't produce any of it. So that's part one. Um, part two, uh, people who do that kind of research I cannot think of any longitudinal study where they tracked one person, you know, over a long period of time. You know, and just not the funding for it. What they, and, and what they have done, though, is they have taken people and random different groups and then taken them through a mindfulness training for sometimes just as eight weeks. It's quite brief. And then at the end of the training, compare their brains to each other. Right? And then at the end of the training, there is a marked difference in the brains, typically with more activation and even thicker neural tissue. Because synapses, new synapses can form in, within five to ten minutes based on neurons firing together, wiring, starting to wire more together. Um, so there is evidence that over a period of time, oh yeah. it's even not, a short period of time, one develops these. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it's an excellent, it's a rigorous question, a very good question. And, and there is actually evidence that that, act, that, that does happen. Um, Thank you. It doesn't just happen with meditation. It, it also happens, for example, with London taxi cab drivers. At the end of their training, where they have to memorize the spaghetti snarl of streets in London, they have a measurably thicker hippocampus, which is, does visual spatial memory, than they did at the very beginning. So. Um, you know, it's always been understood that the brain had some plasticity, because how else could we learn anything? What's new is the extent of its plasticity, the extent to which it changes, and the degree to which um, fairly modest forms of mental training. I mean, just assigning people who meditate to, to a mindfulness program, they will meditate maybe 20 minutes most days, if you're lucky, Re research subjects in the real world, you know, actually can have a measurable change in the brain within um, some weeks. Interesting one, study done on expert piano players. They were given a piece of music which had to work, I don't know, the, I forget the details, but this is the basics of it. They had to really use, let's say, the left little finger to play this piece, okay? So they took these expert piano players, uh, divided them into two groups, and one group played the piece for, let's say, something like 10 minutes a day for six weeks and they measured their brains before and after. At the end of that training, um, they had measurably thicker cortex in part of the motor strips in the brain, motor, motor cortex, that controlled the left little finger. Right? Now that's kind of remarkable, but ho-hum, they, they practiced it. But then there was the second group. Second group of expert piano players did not move a muscle. They just visualized, they just imagined, not visualized, they just imagined playing this piece. 10 minutes a day, let's say 10 minutes a day for six weeks, all right? And then their brains were measured at the end of it all. They too had measurably thicker neural, motor cor neural cortex in regions that control the left little finger. Now I think that 
Imagined experience is not as influential, generally speaking, as lived experience. There's, we're flesh and blood creatures, we're deeply social animals. The real thing in the flesh, really embodied, you know, embodied enacted existence. That's really who we are. That said, boy, I've paying, I'm paying a lot more attention to what I casually indulge inside my mind based on this appreciation that neurons that fire together are wiring together, even if it's just murmuring in the back of my mind. Okay, how about one more person, then I'll move on. Yeah, and we'll, do, we'll move into a practice real soon, yeah. <coughs> uh-huh. I thought that the Dalai Lama and some Buddhist monks had undergone some of this um, testing and that mm-hmm. it was continuous. Isn't that true? And it was continuous? And that, What's that, the it? that they continue to be studied. Oh, great. Um, well, the Dalai Lama has been a great fan of this kind of research. And um, he, so he has supported it. I don't believe he himself has ever been you know, wired up. I don't, I've, I've, I'm very involved in that world, and I've not, I don't know that. Maybe he has. I'm seeing someone nod. Maybe he did in one case. But the larger point about uh, he has really been encouraging to monks in his tradition to be studied. And these studies are certainly ongoing. Absolutely. Just recently a study was concluded, uh, run out of UC Davis, fairly nearby here. You might know of this called the Shamata Project. Shamata is a word for concentration. So <coughs> they took people on a three-month retreat. That's a pretty serious meditation retreat, you know, three months. And they compared and they studied their brains. It was an expensive study, multi-million dollar study. And they really examined their brains as well as other measures. One of the interesting findings they had that's, that's come out of this is that those who did the retreat compared to a control group, and they were quite matched. They were, these were meditators. They were, these were people who wanted to do a three-month retreat. Um, what they did is they randomly assigned them to two groups, ran the first group through the retreat, and then they let the second group do another three-month retreat. So they're the same kind of people, basically. The people who got to do the retreat at the end of three months had um, longer telomeres on their DNA. Telomeres are little tails at the end of DNA that when DNA, when cells, cells like every, in, I believe it's something like 200,000 red blood cells die every sec, every minute, and, or, and 200,000 new ones are born every minute in the body. So there's a lot of turnover of cells in the body. Cells divide, cells die. When cells divide, um, you know, DNA has to be copied. The problem is when DNA gets copied, sometimes errors can start slipping into it, and those errors become cancer cells or other kinds of problems. Telomeres are very involved in um, good replication of DNA. So having long telomeres is really a way to prevent aging. As we age, telomeres shrink. And the shrinking of the telomeres is associated with a gradual breakdown of the body as we age. So doing things that keep those telomere tails long is a good thing. And one of the things that does it is meditation. Probably through both a reduction of stress and, the increase of, and an increase of positive emotion in general. Those seem like two mental factors. Less of the bad, more of the good. In other words, less stress, more positive emotion. But clearly it's a research finding. And um, because meditation has this reputation, as I suspect many of you have bumped into um, yourselves, as this sort of woo-woo, new age, you know, flaky, non-scientific thing, when you are able to publish research about it in major journals, so the slides I'm showing you are all from super gold standard major journals, um, you really need to have robust results. So these are very legit results. Pretty exciting stuff. Or they've done studies on people uh, in an experiment who some people get $20 from the experimenter. Everybody gets $20. And then you have a choice. Some people would get a choice. Like, do you want to keep it or do you want to give it to charity? The ones who gave it to charity had more of a, of a reward activation in reward centers of their brain. Pretty cool, right? Maybe that's a segue to my next section because I'm conscious of time and I want to end by 9.15. I'll also stick around here and chat with some of you if you like. Okay? So, point is, there are things we can do. This is, these are examples of using our mind to change our brain, to change the mind for the better. When you do methods like this, you're targeting 
the hardware, based on some basic simple understanding of the hardware, to get it to do things for you that are useful, that you care about. Okay? Okay. So, this for me is a, I'll make a quick point about this. Um, I think there are three great phases in healing and in psychological growth and in spiritual practice. In the first phase, we be with something difficult. We be with what's there. We experience the experience, right? We bear it. We stay with it. We open to it. We hold it in mindful, spacious awareness. Critically important step. Always worth doing. Uh, for one, it helps us, you know, surround what's there in it and hold it in a bigger space. Okay. But, on the other hand, sometimes that's not enough. And it doesn't change just because we're aware of it, right? That's where the second and third phases come in where we release what's there that's problematic as best we can, and we, in the third phase, replace it with some positive alternative. All, right? All three phases are important. I think the first phase is the most fundamental, because sometimes you just can't release it or replace it, but you can always be with it. You can always hold it in open, spacious awareness. On the other hand, sometimes people need to do the third phase first, because in order to resource themselves to be with what's there, right, they need more resources. They need more steadiness of mind. They need a greater sense of safety. They need a greater sense of feeling cared about, that others are with them. You know what they say in AA about the mind? It's a dangerous neighborhood. Never go in alone. Okay? <laughs> you want to have an internal ally. Sometimes we tell people, oh, just be mindful, or oh, just get in touch with your feelings. And it's like opening a trap door to hell. <laughs> They're not ready for it. For me, there's a humility to realize, boy, I need to work on the fundamentals first. I think about Dante's Inferno. He went into hell, but he had a companion. He had the angel Virgil by his side. Right. I think it's also the case that some people, guys often are this way, I admit it, who just want to fix stuff. Feel it, forget about it. Get rid of it. Right? You know, it's like garbage. Smelly, brown bag, flies buzzing around. I know what to do with it. Right? And that was me. I was very, very good at the second phase. I realized after a while, though, I wasn't getting the results I wanted. I needed to, I needed to be honest. I needed to do the first phase more deeply. It's also true that some people get stuck in mindfulness. They get stuck in just being with it. And they be with it, 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 and it's still there. And past the point that's useful, particularly if it's intensely negative, past the point that's useful, just being with it is like doing one more lap in hell. Every time you go around the track, because neurons that fire together wire together, you're digging the track deeper. All right? I think mindfulness has actually been somewhat overrated in the last 20, 30 years as Buddhism's come to the West, and actually as psychotherapy has become more mindfulness-focused. I think it's the primary phase, but it's not, su it's not sufficient. As great a fan of mindfulness as the Buddha allocated one of the eight elements of the Noble Eightfold Path to right mindfulness. But he also allocated one of the eight elements to right effort, which has to do with letting go of what's unwholesome and replacing it with what's wholesome. You know, pulling weeds, in other words, and then planting flowers in the garden of the mind and therefore the brain. So all of these phases are really important. It's in this context that I'm going to talk now about uh, the third phase, taking in replacing, because I think it's a very important phase, and it's one that people often don't do enough of, and as a result, in effect, they're leaving money on the table all day long. They're not taking in positive resources and experiences when they could. So that's what I want to talk about now. Okay? So to put this in context, let's look at the evolving brain. Long, strange trip it's been, right, the Grateful Dead lyric, my new title, three and a half billion years of life, 600 million years of the nervous system, you know, 60-ish million years of primates, two and a half million years since our ancestors first began manufacturing stone tools, with brains a third our size. The brain has tripled in, the la in volume in the last several million years. Much of that uh, new uh, neural real estate is zoned for relationships. It's allocated to love, broadly defined. Pretty cool. And evolution is... Con Oh, about a large fraction of the tripling of, of the volume of the brain and cortex is used for relationship functions, for language, for uh, empathy, for attachment, bonding, cooperative planning, 
um, gossip, uh, negotiating, alliances, coalitions, all the stuff you see on Survivor, right? All that kind of social dynamic stuff. You know, very involved in, you know, the cortex is very able to do that sort of thing. Right? Evolution has not stopped. It continues even up to the current time. Okay, hold them high. How many of you have blue, green, or hazel eyes? I know who you are. Okay, keep them up. Keep them up. Have you seen X-Men recently? You are mutants. <laughs> mutants. I'm old school, old stock. Nobody had blue eyes until about 5,000 years ago, literally. Somebody was born right around Denmark. They know this from DNA studies. Who had blue eyes and was very popular. <laughs> had a lot of great grandchildren and you're in the room today evolution is ongoing okay kind of cool all right anyway so as the brain evolved it did so in three basic stages um i alluded to these previously we have kind of the you know uh, insect reptile brain the green part then we have sort of the uh early mammalian early bird brain the paleomammalian limbic system. And then on top of it, we have the primate and um, advanced mammals and especially human layers of the brain. As I said, we've got these three stages. The brain stem um, is very involved in avoiding harm. Fear is the original emotion. You know, in the wild, rule one is eat lunch today. Don't be lunch today. All right? Okay. Get away from those sticks. Avoid those sticks. Second stage, uh, mammalian, approach rewards, get those carrots, all right? And then third stage, human, attached to us, all right? Attaching, as I talked about just a little bit ago, is very fundamental in the nervous system. Um, you can see here a primate mother and her child. A little detail, notice how that kid, I have no idea how old it, uh, it is, probably just a few months old, can hold on to his or her mother. Human infants can't. Humans have the longest childhood of any animal on the planet. In that long period of vulnerability, which enables the brain to quadruple in volume from the size it is with a newborn to an adult brain, as the brain quadruples in volume, which is also the greatest um, increase in brain size from birth to maturity, as it does so, it needs to have a long childhood to make use of those capacities, to learn all the things you need to learn. To, to be an adult human. On the other hand, that long childhood entails a long period of vulnerability and dependency, including for the mother that cares for the child. In most mammal species and also most primate species, 95% of all primate species, the father does nothing for the kid besides contribute one cell that doesn't live very long. Right? That's it. Okay? That's 95% of the primate species. Um, so with mom's on her own, but if you've got a child that, you're, um, that you have to carry in your arms and you can't run away from charging tigers, you need more bonding with your partner and you need a village it takes to raise a child. So the evolution of the size of the brain required an evolution of love and an evolution of sociability, social skills, teamwork, language, cooperation, friendship, uh, kinship and all the rest of that enabled the evolution of the brain. That's the social brain theory. It's the idea that love, broadly defined, has been truly the primary driver of the evolution of our brain, certainly over the last several million years and probably longer. That's pretty neat, I think. So we have uh, networks. It's not doing anything, Josh, because it's quick time looking for a picture. Oh, oh, you don't, you can't show these images, right? Okay. Well, I'll just tell you what you're missing. So I have an image first of a um, family. Then I have an image of Habitat for Humanity. And then I have an image of a human being and a whale nearly holding hands. As the whale, true story, off of the Farallons, you may know this, this humpback whale was trapped. And, uh, what? Yes! One of my favorite pictures of all time. Yay! Yay! You may know this story. This is a whale that was trapped in fishing lines and other things, crab pots. Um, 
you know, I'm seeing nods. You may know some of the details even more than I do. So anyway, a uh, scuba diver spotted it, whatever, radioed back for help. A team of scuba divers has spent hours and hours and hours very carefully cutting these lines very close to the whale, which if it freaked out at any moment, would kill them. Then when they was all done, when the whale was uh, all untied or the ropes were cut, um, it swam around with great joy, leaping out of the water, and then went to each of the divers one by one, in effect, to connect with each one. And this is an image of one of those moments. Really shivery, doesn't it? You know, in other words, cooperation, love, if you will, crosses species boundaries too sometimes. All right. So that's the cool news. All right. That's the good news. Now... The bad news, all right. The negativity bias, all right. Sorry about this part. You know, while getting carrots is important, it's more important typically in the wild to avoid those sticks. Because if you fail to get a carrot today, you'll probably have a chance at a carrot tomorrow. But if you fail to avoid that stick today, wow, no more carrots forever, all right. This negativity bias is embedded in our brain and our body in a variety of ways. For one, Generally speaking, people learn faster from pain than from pleasure. Sorry. Two, it's very easy to teach mammals and humans that they're helpless and very hard to unlearn that training. For example, you can teach dogs that they're helpless in half a dozen trials, typically. But to teach them that they actually have some control over their fate, they're actually a hammer rather than a nail, it takes dozens and dozens, sometimes over a hundred trials, to teach the dog that, for example, all it has to do to escape painful, non-lethal electrical shock, shock is just to get up and walk ten feet across a line. All right? That's all it has to do. But to teach the dog that it can do that, the experimenters have to drag the dog with rubber gloves and rubber boots on the electrified floor that it can just cross the pen, just cross this little line to safety. We're very vulnerable to a sense of helplessness. That's why I think it's very important to pay attention to where we do have efficacy, which is very often only in our own mind, but at least there we're the cue ball rather than the eight ball. Another example of the negativity bias is in relationships, where research has shown that you know, couples that seem like strong couples that are likely to stay married or stay together for the long haul have at least a five to one ratio of positive to negative interactions. And some of them had an even higher ratio. It's cautionary and humbling to think about the last week with one's partner or the last few hours, you know, where was that ratio? In effect, a single negative interaction is as powerful as five positive ones. As an example, you know, you have 20 things that happen in a relationship with a work, co-worker or your partner or somebody in your family. 20 things happen in a day, little things. 10 are mildly positive, 9 are neutral, 1 is mildly negative. What's the one you think about as you fall asleep at night? That's the negativity bias at work again. Uh, one of the main consequences of the negativity bias is that um, when anything negative happens, so first of all, the brain is continually scanning for threat. As soon as it finds any kind of threat, it locks onto it and kind of has tunnel vision. It loses perspective very quickly because it's expending all its resources to deal with the stick, you know, to deal with this potential tiger. So it locks onto the negative, reacts strongly to it. The nervous system reacts more intensely, more, more strongly to a negative stimulus than to an equally intense positive stimulus. So it reacts. And then it stores the information about the event and one's own reactions immediately in memory. Bam! Fast tracked into memory. Dedicated systems. You know, T1 lines in the memory stores. Okay? And then if anything happens in life later that's remotely similar, whoosh, pulls up the original record. Right? But positive experiences have ordinary memory systems, plain vanilla memory systems. How do those work? There's a short-term memory buffer and long-term storage. And you have to hold something in the short-term buffer for 10, 20, 30 seconds in a row, often with intensity, often with repetition, to get it to transfer to long-term storage. How often do we do that? We're having positive experiences. Most people have lots of little positive experiences. You're aware of them for a few seconds. They sit in short-term memory stores. Then they're gone. They didn't have time to transfer. Then another positive experience comes in. It sits in short-term memory buffers, doesn't have time to transfer. 
Positive experiences, unless they're million dollar moments, generally flow through the brain, in effect, like water through a sieve. But negative ones are caught every time. Therefore, in effect, the brain is like Velcro for negative experiences, but slippery Teflon for positive ones. And the result is a growing pile in implicit memory, not so much memory for specific events, that's explicit memory, but implicit memory, the lived residues, the, the residues rather of lived experience that form our expectations, our mood, they shape our inclinations, they shape our assumptions, they shape our biases, they shape what we look for in life, right? The contents of implicit memory uh, through this just generic hardwired neurological tendency tend to grow increasingly negative unless people have tons and tons of positive experiences or in particular take in the good of positive experiences. This has huge implications for just everyday life and it has huge implications for any kind of therapeutic practice. So how about I show you the um, steps of taking in the good and then we'll move to a wrap tonight and maybe finish with a little practice of taking in the good. So, I did not invent taking in the good. This idea of deliberately internalizing positive experiences, of mindfully internalizing positive experiences, is kind of sort of implicit and present in a lot of paths of growth or practice or therapy. It's fine. What I have tried to do is really think through what are the actual steps of truly mindfully internalizing a positive experience and how can we you know really work with the neurology here and why do we need to work with the neurology to truly go through life like a human vacuum cleaner sucking up all the little pearls that are strewn you know on the ground around us so three steps first we have to let the needle move that's the most important step of all isn't it true so much of the time first of all we don't notice the good fact in the first place and the second even if we notice it Oh yes, I finished the laundry. Oh yeah, I got the kids to bed. Oh yeah, you paid me a compliment. Oh, oh yeah, I, I, rec I know I'm a good person in this way. Oh yeah, flowers are blooming. Oh yeah, you know, do we feel very much? You know, very often the needle doesn't move very much at all. So the first step is to let the needle move. And that has to do often uh, with working through various obstructions to letting yourself feel truly good. Maybe there's a fear that if you let yourself feel good, you'll lower your guard, and that's when they really smack you. Or you'll lose your edge, you know, if you're kind of a busy type A person. Or maybe there's a sense that uh, feeling good is somehow disloyal. If you grew up with a depressed parent, or you had a sibling who had a disability or, a, or an illness. Uh, or maybe you grew up in a culture in which it wasn't okay to be caught feeling happy or exuberant or really good. Or maybe um, in terms of genderizing it, you know, you're a man and men are supposed to be stoic and strong. Or you're a woman and women are supposed to make other people happy first. Whatever it is, often people encounter obstructions to feeling good when they try to start taking in the good. So the trick is to work through the obstruction and then come back to the practice of taking in the good. And most of the good we take in is small, everyday stuff of, you know, just normal life. Second step, that's the money step, that's when you stay with it. You get those neurons firing away. You know, the brain is extraordinary, it's remarkable, and at a deep level, it's kind of a biological machine. So you work the machine. The more intensely those neurons are firing together, the longer they're firing together, and the more whole body the firing is, the deeper the memory trace. Any single moment of taking the good is usually not transformative, but over time, I've seen this had reported to me repeatedly, if people, for example, say, okay, I'm going to really start doing this in a real focused way. I'm going to be kind of mindful about this and dedicated to it half a dozen times a day to take the 10, 15, 20 seconds to just really register a positive experience. Or maybe just before bed or as part of my meditation or prayer, I'm going to take a, a minute or so to just kind of open to the positive emotion, positive experience, and just sink into it as it sinks into me. People report remarkable changes. The third step is kind of overlaps with the second, where we sense and intend that it's going in, like water into a sponge. I do this with kids, like a jewel going into the treasure chest of the heart, or just a knowing. 
when we sense and intend, we are priming memory systems. You know, it's kind of like I remember being in Hawaii one time, a truly amazing sunset, I mean, really amazing. And I thought to myself, I remember this one, and I can see it right now in my mind, because I had kind of primed my memory systems to really register it. That's what we do in the third step. Okay. So how about some questions or comments so far, and then maybe we'll finish on a little practice here. So questions or comments so far? Yeah. Um, Thomas. As far as getting um, um, a positive experience to soak in, do you mind, does it, does it matter, does it help if you uh, engage more senses? That's that part, yes, about um, feel it in your body and emotions. You're exactly right. Um, feel it in the whole body. You could say it to yourself, you know. Um, you can kind of enact it out a little bit. Great. Basically, we, we can take in the good under, under three circumstances or conditions. The first is, in real time, something good has happened. A good fact has occurred. That's an opportunity to take in the good. Okay? That's one way. Second way is to recall a real event that happened. Okay? For example, we think back on something we accomplished or a way someone was loving toward us. That's the second way. The third way is to imagine something that never happened and yet is still very important to us. As an important detail, in any one of those, we certainly can just take in willy-nilly good experiences. It's also true that for just about everybody, there are specific good experiences, specific positive experiences that are their own vitamin C, that are the... that are the particular experiences that will fill the hole in their own heart. For example, if a person grew up with uh, little safety, grew up in a dangerous neighborhood, was maybe assaulted as a kid, or was in a, in a home environment that was really chaotic and unsafe, for that person now, later in life, what they really need are experiences that have to do with the avoiding system of the brain, which is to say, experiences of strength, safety and protection. Those are their particular vitamin C. You know, if you have scurvy, you need vitamin C. If you have anemia, you need iron. So, you see what I mean? On the other hand, suppose a person has, has felt thwarted in life, or, or had had their autonomy obstructed, or um, has been really un disappointed in their capacity to make things happen, has felt helpless. That's the kind of person who really should take in experiences in the second system, the approaching reward system. So taking in experiences of some kind of accomplishment or really looking for ways in which they're a hammer and not a nail. Or if you're like me and you, don't really, you didn't really have issues in those first two systems, but in the third system you felt unseen, uh, unappreciated, uh, excluded. I was very young going through school and so I was this kind of dorky, nerdy guy on the, uh, as an outsider. Um, if that's what your hole in the heart is about, then what you need are supplies, vitamin C, that's more in the third system of attaching to us. us. In other words, you need experience from others of feeling cared about, empathized with, uh, wanted, cherished, and included. So it's worth asking yourself, what are your key vitamin Cs? What are the particular supplies, the key supplies, that you really need? You know, a way to answer that question is to ask yourself, what would have made all the difference in the world? Growing up, or in my last fill-in-the-blank, relationship, job, you know, career, whatever. What would have made all the difference in the world? Or, currently, what does my heart really long for? And often there's a longing that we don't want to admit to ourselves. You know, because we're kind of afraid to really give over to that longing out of fear that it will be a fast track to pain. But if we open to that longing, it can tell us what is the vitamin C that we really need. And then when we find it, and life often has opportunities routinely to take in the vitamin C that our heart really longs for. Excellent.
couple more. How about right there because you're close and then you. All right, first right there. She's just a mind reader. Yeah. She just, just like that. She has Jedi skills. You know? okay. okay, I'll hold it closer this time. So if you had a childhood where you were in danger, there was violence and cruelty and there was no love and affection, how can you get that as an adult? How can you fill that gap? Okay, so there are two questions. Well, first of all, it helps as an adult to have some um, facts that are relatively safe. In other words, you want to have some safety as an adult. Let's say if you were unsafe as a child, mm -hmm. you would be obviously as an adult probably safer than you were as a little kid. Right there is an opportunity. Or as an adult, probably you have more choice over your relationships. You're not stuck with those people. Right? You have the relationships of choice rather than the relationships of birth. Right? And with your relationships more of choice, you probably are with saner people. Also as an adult, you have more capacity to influence them so that you get what you, what you need. You get decent, ordinary, human, humane treatment, what everyone deserves. Right? So hopefully, there are good facts in one's life today. They're not perfect facts. It's a very interesting thing. Uh, what do you do? How do you heal wounds that had to do with a lack of a, of a profound and deeply important kind of cherishing? And in your life today, you just don't have that kind of cherishing. You have good friends, perhaps. You have people who care about you, but you don't have that particular special thing. Well, honestly, you do the best you can. You know, in the pie, as it were, you're lacking that particular slice, but there's a lot of other caring. There's a lot of other kindness and goodwill toward oneself that is available to us to take in. And the willingness to take in what we can, even though it's not the whole pie, is very important for personal growth. With my, with, um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and, okay, right there, yeah. The current issue of Yes Magazine has focused on um, prisons in this country um, and how prisoners can avoid um, going recidivism if they have education, mm. if they have uh, meditation, all these positive things. Is there any way that you can make this known so that it could be oh. um, applied so this to, to reduce the crime rates and the violence, ah. particularly in this country where the prison population is so high. Yeah, we have the highest per capita prison population yes. of any country, as you know. Yeah. Um, well, first, I'm kind of here the messenger of, of what's pretty widely known um, in certain circles, you know. And... The good news, I'm aware a bit of what's being done in prisons these days. First of all, most of it's terrible. And interestingly, uh, in prison settings, there's a real interest in mindfulness. Many people there were, are, have no interest in it whatsoever, but uh, they've done, for example, I don't know if you've seen some of these documentaries, you can get them or see clips of them on YouTube. There, there's meditation retreats in prison. You know. Um, very few. Yeah, very, very, very few. Goenka has been a wonderful, he's an uh, Indian teacher. I think he's from India. Burma. Burma, is he? Burma, thank you. He's in India now. Okay, good. Thank you for that. Yeah, great teacher. Um, very interested in bringing retreats into prison settings. So other than that, I don't know much more than that, but you're completely right. You're completely right. I think also uh, bringing this material to children prevention, an ounce of prevention, you know, being worth a pound of cure. Uh, I'm very interested myself. Uh, this will be more where I'm going in my writing and, and so forth, this particular business of mindfully internalizing positive experience. Because I think it's a foundational skill and at the heart of resilience. And at the heart of mood regulation, self-confidence, healing from trauma. I think it's a critically important skill. And it makes me happy because maybe I'll move to a wrap on this point, because we have around us, you know, so many opportunities to take in the good. Uh, you know, sometimes people think that if I take in the good, that means I'm selfish, but come on, here we go. Um, but as Bertrand Russell writes here, 
you know, if we take in the good, if we feel good ourselves, um, we become good people. We become gooder people, you know. He says that good life is a happy life, not because being good makes you happy, but because being happy makes you good. Lots of research has shown as we fill our own cup, we have more to offer to others. So as you fill your own cup here, besides helping yourself and being kind to yourself, it's a wonderful way to send ripples of goodness out into the world, touching so many others in ways known and unknown. Never doubt, you know, for me, it's one of the huge takeaways from this material, never doubt the impact of small things adding up over time. Their impact both in our own brains and then rippling through us, their impact widening out in wider and wider circles into the whole big world. So how about we take in the good for a minute or so and then I'll formally end, all right? So if you could, just kind of sit up for one second. This will take about a minute. And going through these steps, hey Josh, can you go back three, go back two to the three steps? One, perfect. Okay? So bring to mind one or more positive facts in your life. Perhaps something you're grateful for. Or maybe a relationship that makes you feel good. Perhaps an appreciation of something good in you. Your own practice, perhaps. Your own sincerity. Your own good heart. Maybe a sense of God, the divine. So as you do this practice, both try to do it and be aware of what happens in your mind as you do it. And so now in this first step, see if you can let the knowing of this good fact become an increasingly positive experience. Moving into the second step, staying with this positive experience, relishing it. Staying with it, savoring it. Maybe letting a little small smile come up. Letting it fill your body, your mind. Staying with it. Opening to it like a flower to the sun. Meanwhile, in the third step, sensing and intending that this experience sink into you. Perhaps visualizing something like light coming into you, like a golden balm, a salve, sinking in and soothing maybe places inside that have been wounded in the past, bruised, hurt, perhaps even feeding a little kid inside you. Or simply knowing somehow that this positive experience is weaving its way into the fabric of your brain and your being. And then last, as a little bonus, offering the benefit of this positive experience in you out into the wider world, sensing or knowing how it may ripple out from you to touch the people you live with or work with, no, widening further out into the whole world. May it 
be so. Okay, come on back. Many, many bows and thanks. This was really sweet, very special. Wish you well. I'll stick around. Uh, be good to yourself. And I'll say one last little thing. I um, once was in a workshop with a major meditation teacher, Joseph Goldstein. Some of you probably know that name. And I had had this insight, actually, uh, that was quite important and significant. And I told it to him. And he nodded and smiled and said, yes, good. And then he said two words I've never forgotten, and I offer them to you as well. He said, keep going. So may we keep going. Thanks. Thank you.